The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. Can't study it in carnality. The evidence of carnality in your life is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue or overt sins. How do you get out of carnality and back into spirituality? Got to confess your sin. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and then to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It restores us to the ministry of the Holy Spirit who is, has the great ministry of teaching us truth out of the word of God. He, in fact, he has a title called the spirit of truth that Jesus discussed about in John 14, 15, and 16, his spirit of truth. And the reason the spirit of truth is important in your soul is because Jesus said it is what sets you free from the cosmic system of lies. John 8, 32, very important aspect. So let's take a moment through your own priesthood to have a word of prayers in silence. Uh, confess sin if necessary. Enter your prayer life and pray that God would show you, show you some unique things because apparently this is a, a huge, a huge a missing link in a lot of people's theology of uh, the angelic conflict. They, they don't understand that. And we're going to study it over the next few weeks. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful tonight for these have come our way. We lift on before you tonight, Father, and pray for him and his ministry with his family and with the community and with medical staff and people that he has to deal with. There's ministry every, everywhere around us. Horton says you always, always pay attention to the, the six feet, the, the, the sphere of six feet around you. When people step into that, God has sent him, and uh, I really think there's a lot of truth in that over my years. I pray tonight as we look at the angelic conflict, what led to Satan revolting and taking a third of the angels with him and, and, and revolting against God? Well, I believe the scriptures is going to tell us just like it did in Ephesians 1.4. It's what God designed before the foundation of the world. And what was the centerpiece of the plan of God that caused, it was the centerpiece of the plan of God that caused Satan to revolt. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, <clears throat> today we're going to look at three important aspects of the origin of the angelic conflict, what led to the angelic revolt? I mean, we, you know, we're, we're familiar with three great passages on the angelic conflict. We're familiar with Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, and Revelation 12. That's not on your paper unless you write it. But that is the revolt and the consequences of it. What I think people often don't pay attention to is what led that revolt. What caused that revolt? Uh, that was one of the big questions I had when I, and, and we will we will look at all these passages. We will look at these three great passages, and we will look at the revolt in itself and the warfare. But tonight we're looking at the origin. What 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 was it that led this revolt? And uh, I, I believe we'll see it tonight. It, it's interesting to me that once I understood. I was like most people. I, I wasn't taught that, listen, I wasn't taught in any of the churches I attended before I got to Baraka. I was never taught about the angelic conflict. I was told about, I was told about put the old armor of God on, but the, but the warfare was very vague. I never could get any answers on the war. I was interested in warfare about it, who we fight and how's it work, you know, all that. I, I never could get any answers on that. When, when I went into my theology training, I got none there. And, and when I'd bring it up, it was kind of like, well, you know, eh, I couldn't get any answers there. And so it was a breath of fresh air when a pastor one day opened the scriptures and taught me about the angelic conflict and showed it to me out of the scriptures, front and backwards and sideways, <laughs> uh, that, which I hope to do to you to take all, all of the mystery out of this thing because... It is a primo. It is a primo doctrine. The angelic conflict's a big deal, 
And uh, but once I once I, my here's my point that once I understood the angelic conflict, then when I began to study the Bible, I saw something interesting. The Bible opens with it. Genesis one one through three. It opens with it. Listen to me, and it closes with it. Um, nineteen through twenty two. Revelation 19 through 22, it closes with it. The Bible opens with it and closes with it. And I tell you, once you understand the angelic conflict, you see it all through the pages. All the way from Genesis through Revelation, you see this angelic conflict where Satan is always out to, dis uh, to disrupt and destroy one primary thing. You know what that one primary thing is? Christ. Right from the start, Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman. We know that's Christ. <clears throat> and the whole warfare, once I understood that, then I went, wow, this whole warfare from front to back of the Bible is about the angelic conflict and the warfare between Satan and Christ. See, most people say, and I do, I do often just to make general ideas, we say that the war is between Satan and God. There is no war. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> well, what it is is between, that's how uh, that, the uh, origin, we talk about war against God, but the truth of the matter, it's a war about Satan and Christ. <clears throat> and, and by the way, just to kind of cheer your night up, we're the primary target in it today because we represent Christ. You and I are the primary targets. He can't pick on Christ anymore because Christ knocked his lights out. And so the primary target in the church age, the primary target are Christians, ones like Christ. If you think you're going to walk through his world and not get whacked, so you really... It's really important to understand the angelic conflict, and it's really important how to understand how, how, how to fight him and be successful, to be a victor and not a victim. If you, don't know how, if you don't understand the angelic conflict and you don't understand how to be a victor, you will be a victim. Oh, you will be. Listen, you're either a victim or a victor. And if you don't understand it and don't know how to fight it, you will be a victim. You'll be saved. You will be a believer. You will go to church and you will be a victim. And I can tell you that. You need to listen to it. And over the, over the weeks, I'm going to show you how this thing works. But tonight we're looking at what led to the revolt. That's my point. Point number one. What led to the origin of the angelic conflict began in eternity past before the foundation of the world? Several times in the Bible, this phrase, before the foundation of the world, <clears throat> is made. Ephesians is not the only one. First Peter, uh, Peter makes a mention of it in the, his first book. <clears throat> it is a pretty established idea, okay? When we open Genesis, we realize there was something already going on before he, I mean, we have God created the heavens and the earth. That's verse 1. <clears throat> then something happens in verse 2. Where the world has to be recreated. And then we have the creation story, which is really the restoration story in verses three through, you know, that's day one, two, three, four, five, six. <clears throat> now in Ephesians, and so my point is when they talk about foundation of the world and they talk about something that went on in the past, and, and listen, God chose Christ. <laughs> Before the foundation of the world. Before the book of Genesis uh, it gets engaged in creating a world that you and I are going to be live on and be inhabited, that we'll, we will inhabit, uh, there's a whole discussion on that, that. That absolutely. You know the word tohu wabohu? The, uh, in Genesis uh, where it says that the in verse 2, where the world, uh, in verse 1, God created the heavens and the earth, in verse 2, and uh, it became tohu wabohu, without, it became form, formless and void. Well, tohu is a really interesting word, because tohu, actually in the Hebrew, tohu means uninhabitable. 
uninhabitable. I'll show it to you later in my study. It's an interesting concept. Uh, without form and void, tohu wa bohu is how the is in the Hebrew. Now, in our passage of Ephesians one, he says that God. I lost my place. God. Well. Keep losing my place. Just as he, blessed be the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as he chose us in him, God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. You know, and, well, that's what we call the plan of God. When, when God begins to do things, and, and that's what, why we call it the eternal life conference in theology, trying to put a tag on it, some kind of identity, so that when we refer to it, you go like, oh, I know what Ron's talking about. When I say eternal life conference, you know, we're talking about the plan of God that was designed before the foundation of the world. And so we just tag it with a term that helps us theologically understand that term. So I don't have to go back and explain it every time I say eternal life conference. We know that the plan of God, he chose him. Now, also in this same, this same chapter, um, I put on your paper verses 18 through 23. So let's take a look at that for a moment. And it, what he does in this first chapter is show you the plan of God. What he's talking about in the book of Ephesians is a plan of God that was designed in eternity past. And you know how he's going to close this book out? He's talking about this, that it, he's talking about the eternal life. The whole book is about God's God's eternal plan designed the eternity past that we now live under dispensationally. Are you with me? You know how he closes this book out? <laughs> Spiritual warfare. It, it, that's how he closes the book. In, in chapter 6, he's, he's going to talk about how you win in the angelic conflict with the word of God. And, and, the, and how, how well we've been equipped uh, to be victorious in this. This is the book, man. It's a powerful little book. I tell you, I believe I, I've translated this book a couple of times, and every and and every time I go in it, I find stuff I didn't I didn't get. It, it is the book of Ephesians is theologically very deep. Theologically, it's very deep, and, and even in the Greek language, it is. Now I'll show you some of it today, just kind of interesting, just to show you. Uh, some interesting things about how, how that is. But in looking at verses 18, so I wanted to show you why. So I jumped to verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ. Now, listen, he's, t he's walking out. Listen, what he said, what did he, what, listen to me now. What did he originally say one of the centerpieces in the plan of God was in eternity past at the eternal life conference? To do what? It, verse, three, verse four. Just as he chose us in him, Christ, before the foundation of the world. So, so the whole book is telling you, he said, in verse 3, I'm just showing you what you're missing. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, watch this now, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings, where? In the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now he's going to go on and write a great theological book for the dispensation of the church that was designed in eternity past before the foundation of the world that is the, the centerpiece is that God chose us in Christ and everything that flows from that it dispensationally is important. Now we're in the church age. Okay. Did you get that? Yeah. See, so wh wh when I'm getting in now, he's, in, he's starting to move into some deep theology here. And so he's thrown out all these things that fall under the, listen to me now, that fall under the title, blessings, blessing us, in the heavenly places, right? Mm -hmm. Right? <clears throat> That's where I come from. <clears throat> and we got them on earth because in Christ, these blessings flow through Christ. 
and he's now going through and he's and he's laying out all kinds of things that make it blessed makes us blessed in Christ and so he goes on he says I mean verse 20 and he says that he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of God in the heavenly places listen he's back in control of the plan of God he took a, he, he, absence of leave to go to the cross, be buried, die on a cross, be buried, raised from the dead, and then 40 days later was sent back to the Father, and he's back, he's back in the driver's seat, so to speak. Far above all rule, watch this now in verse 21. He, he goes back and he sits on the, on the seat as a victor. <clears throat> Far above all rules and authority, power and, do, and dominion. You're going to see that later in, in uh, chapter 6, verse 11. <clears throat> And every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I can't begin to tell you how much theology is in that last verse. Who fills, listen, of him who fills all in all. You should never be empty of any of the blessings of God because he has, he has put it all in Christ. And when you're in Christ and not just saved, but functioning in that relationship with Christ, he's filling your cup full of blessings. Whoa. That's how Paul opens his book up a powerful book the centerpiece of the plan of God involved the second member of the Godhead Christ his son thus Christ is the centerpiece of the angelic conflict we know that right off the bat as soon as Adam and Eve go boom then <clears throat> we got Genesis 315 right <clears throat> and listen that seed of the woman is traced all the way until Christ comes born of a woman born under the law Galatians 4, 4, uh, or Romans 5, 6. <clears throat> These are great passages on that. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I know. Ben, I've been, I've had, haven't you? Sinus trouble for, for like a whole year. I'll get, get, get it, at least for a minute, and then boom, it comes right back. It's a darnest thing. I mean, what has happened? <clears throat> I'll tell you one thing, though, and I don't know if it's my mind. Or if it actually happened. I, I spent a week in Florida and never had a problem with it. <clears throat> I, I, it might have been my wife's prayer, though, <clears throat> over the floor. Uh, actually, it was at Gulf Shores. It was in Florida. <clears throat> oh, my goodness. Here she comes. The nurse. The nurse. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. I'll take that in a moment. Coffee works a little bit. I'm afraid I... What will? Salt, the, the air from the salt water. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I guess. Mm, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> well, there I go. <laughs> it's back. <laughs> That's for sure. Anyhow, and then uh, another another important uh, passage on this would be Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. I don't have time to go into that today, <clears throat> but it, it shows you also the same line of thinking that we dealt with with uh, Genesis 3.15, Galatians 4.4, 4, uh, Romans 5.6, those passages. <laughs> now, in Ephesians 1.4, the key to me was, just as God the Father chose him, God the Son, before the foundation of the world, for me that was a key, and to make him the centerpiece of the plan of God. I, I think nobody w w wouldn't understand that Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of the plan of God, would you? <laughs> I, I mean... But th there is more. There is more proof of that within the scriptures, as especially in our dispensation. Holy catfish! Everything, everything in our dispensation is about this. <clears throat> now, in First uh, Peter one twenty through twenty one, uh, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Foreknown. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world. In other words. It was a well-known, established fact before the world was ever created.
All the angels knew it. They had been taught this. I mean, they, they were well versed on this idea. It was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Watch this now. But has appeared in these last times, human history, for the sake of who? Alan, there would be a good place to put your name, wouldn't it? Absolutely. That's what I'm thinking, too. Listen, for your sake, Matt, you know why Christ left heaven and came to earth to die on a cross, be buried in Sheol and raised on the third day? It was for us and Got it. And you ought to put your name there because that, listen to me, listen to me, because the devil tells you, listen to me now, the devil tells you probably every day that you're not as important as you think you are. Big shot. Let me tell you something. You are more important than you think you are. You need to think highly of yourself in Christ, not in the world terms. You need to think highly of yourself in Christ. How do you do that? I'll tell you one thing you should do it is study the 50 things and pay attention to the 20 status privileges would be my suggestion. Christ has appeared in these last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God. Is that amazing? See, here, here's where the problem of you, you have an appreciation for that tag. And that's okay, I suppose. But I say that and that's like water off a duck. You know why? And I, I'm not opposed to that. I'm just telling you something because this is a good thing in your life. You were raised to believe in God right off the start. You probably don't ever remember a day in your life when you weren't with a group of people that believed in the absolute existence, absolutely 100% in the existence of God, prayed to him, believed in him, and lived for him, and could tell you stories of how God delivered them. Agreed? And that's a wonderful thing. And so you shouldn't take these little tags, believers in God, because I was one of those guys that did not know any of that until I was 21. And it took me to 23 to wrap my brain around it. So when I read this, I probably read that a little different than most people. Because when it says believer in God, that has a big meaning in my life. Now, it probably does in yours now because you've really gotten on fire with God and his word and, and, and all of that. And so this has a big meaning for you now. But, I mean, this was gigantic in my life. I'm just saying it for me. Who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. We talked about that last night, that word glory. You have no idea how big a deal that is. You have no idea how big a deal that is. Because you get saved and God begins to put the glories in you, puts the glory of God in you, puts the glories of God. Listen, when God answers your prayer that you've just touched the glory of God. When you pray for something and God, you know that God intervened in such a dramatic way that it just leaves chills on you and you're just speechless and, and everything. You just stepped into a moment of the glories of God. And as you grow spiritually mature, you will see that those glories take on. You don't have to have the big things to see it. You can have the little things and you see it. And that's how you know you're growing spiritually because you can see the glory of God in everything you're doing, not just in the big things. That, that word glory is a pretty powerful idea. I mean, most people think that God has it and Christ has it and the Holy Spirit has it. And one day we'll have it when we're, when we're glorified. You're missing all the glories in between, though. 
The, the, the whole journey of the Christian life is one about, about experience, the, the glories of God in your life, in your relationships. It's a lot bigger deal than you think. John, the 17th chapter, this word dominates his prayer life as he, as he, as he goes to the cross. John 17, it dominates his life. This is not the only time, but I wrote this one down. John 17, 5, he says, now, Father, I love, I love the way he prays. But then he was his father in a most personal way. But listen to me, God should be your father in a most personal way, too. Now, it's hard for a baby believer to be in a relationship that's that unique and special, right? They're so dependent. Then immature, they're, they're flopping back and forth with authority issues with the parent, right? Adolescence. It's not until you get to spiritual maturity where you take on a relationship. You know, it was amazing to me. I was in conflict with, with, my, with my children growing up when they hit those teen years. And it's amazing to me, they're the, they're the most wonderful people in my life today as adults. I mean, it's, it's no longer a father and a daughter or a son. It, it, it is truly a whole different relationship because of the adult level, not just of maturity of age, but of spiritual maturity. And it takes on the father aspect takes on a completely different role from a mature level. And that's been, that's been a, a, a wonderful thing in my life. I mean, I'd rather be with my kids than anybody. If, if I got to go someplace for a couple of days with anybody, I w there's nobody in the whole world I'd rather be because they're just fun. They're fun and they're spiritual. You can, you can, you can call a prayer meeting in a moment with them and, and they just switch off and get right into it. It, it is the most wonderful thing. And I know, I know many of you have the same thing, but everybody's, it's possible for everybody. I can tell you that. And so he's, this prayer, he talks this way to the Father. This isn't, oh, God. You know, it's not one of those. It's like, Father, I want to, it's a Father talk. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself. Isn't that interesting? You know what he's going to do? He's going to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world. He's going to be buried in Sheol and raised from the dead. He says, glorify me together with yourself. When you hit spiritual maturity, see, you, you love getting all the glories. You love all the blessings. You love all the happiness in your life. And that's okay. But at some point, you hit spiritual maturity. And you're going to find out that when you enter into the glories of God, prayer life, personal life, whatever it is, falling out of a tree or whatever, you're going to find something in this journey. You're going to find a thankfulness and a, a glory about it as you make your journey through it. As we might say, taking your baby steps got to get up off the ground. You got to be helped to go to the, then the doctors get a hold of you, and then, and then, and then you're back. Oh, but each one of those little deals where you're dependent on God, you, you're, you're stepping into little moments of glory where God does some of the most impossible things for you. And even at the point you can't sense it at that point, other people around you can. It is a miracle, they say. It is a miracle, they say. It is a miracle, he says. They say it's a miracle. Now, they attribute to a lot of things. Oh, if he hadn't been healthy, if he hadn't been this, he hadn't been. That. Truth of the matter, the guy that's going through it, like Alan, he knows it's the glories of God that makes him step, take his baby steps back into a healthy position. This is what Jesus, and, and so here's what you're experiencing. Glorify me together with yourself. This is a deal that's going on in your life with the Father who's walking you out of something, walking you in baby steps and sharing the glory with you. It, it is you and him sharing this glorious moment where you're dependent on him, where you're trusting him, where 
it's okay with me, Father. It's okay with me. And all of that, all those baby steps in, 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 out of what it's in uh, is just, and when you have the maturity to be able to experience that, then each step of that way is kind of gigantic. Do you understand that? Well, you, I, I want you to experience. You have to understand it. You have to learn it to live it, <laughs> right? So this may be a little foggy in your head. I'm just, you know, everything is about foreknowledge, and so I'm just giving you some foreknowledge. I'm just giving you foreknowledge. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Do you see that? Before the world was. See, you're going to have glory with God. When you get to heaven, you're in the glory before the world was. Which is, he, when he makes his prayer, he's talking about the glory that's involved with, with him and God walking through this world journey. Right? Do you see that? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Here's one verse the devil hates. Let me tell you this one. Because he understands whether you do or not, he understands the centerpiece of the plan of God is Jesus Christ. Here's the verse he hates. Now, I mean, this drives him nuts. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except me. Do you know how much he pushes back on that? Oh, I mean, boy. He'll push back on that. I mean, he'll bring the big guns out. He'll bring theologians that got 26 doctorates out. When you say that, and they'll prove you a thousand and one times that that ain't true. I am the way, the truth, and life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. What about those pygmies in Africa or wherever they are? I hear that. Well, I don't know. If they can swim far enough, they could probably get in through our border. So just tell them, come on. <laughs> Here is 2 Corinthians. You know, it's amazing to me. I listened, I listened to Obama today just for a moment. I'm, a, I'm not going to go deep into this. Who actually said, I can't believe people don't want uh, open borders. I mean, we, we ought to be, our nation should be, I mean, He's talking about heaven. We ought to be able to live with one another and open our borders. And yeah, if, if people weren't criminals, we could leave our houses open. How about you, Obama? Do you, you know, do you lock your house at night like the rest of us? Because, well, I don't know. Well, anyhow, uh, that's, I, I feel better. Thank you. Now, listen to me. I'm going to show you some things in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 that Paul gets into. He says, even if, and that's a first-class condition, if that's true, then the then is true. Agreed? That's a first-class condition. If the if is true, then the then is true. Here's what he says. Even if our gospel is veiled, then it is veiled to those who are perishing. You know who the perishing are? Let me tell you. Write this above it. The word perishing, John 3.16. Now, just take a moment, run John 3.16 through your head, because all of you know it. John 3.16. All right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, would not, pe would not pe perish, right? Would not perish, but have eternal life. Would not perish. You think? That's why you need to get saved, because you're in a state of perishing. Right? You're in a state of perishing. You know, how, you know how you got in a state of perishing? Not because you sinned, but because you were born in Adam. It's one of the, it's, it's one of the 13 judicial charges of Adamic sin. Perishing. This is also the word like loss. He came to save the lost. Okay? Now, let me show you something interesting. See the word veiled? See the word is. See the word is veiled? Let me tell you something. The word is is I me. It's a present active and negative. Now, it's not on your paper. I don't think I put it on your paper. Did I put it on your paper? Yes. I'm, I spoil you people so much. And then the word veiled. K-A-L-U-P-T-O. 
Notice that's a perfect passive participle. You know what we call that in the Greek language? We call that a perfect periphrastic. It requires, it, it's a participle that is, that has imi. It's a participle with imi. And whatever the tense is of the participle is what makes it a periphrastic whatever. Like you say, if that's a perfect, then that's a perfect periphrastic. Are you with me? That's just simple Greek. I'm not, I'm not giving anything heavy. Now, what's this? I call it a perfect paraphrastic. If it's a paraphrastic, it means it has the helping verb of is, which is I me, absolute status quo verb of existence. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. All right. That, it's an absolute status quo verb of existence. Now, this is important that that he doesn't have to put it. He doesn't have to make this a paraphrastic. He doesn't have to put is on that. When he does, and the part a paraphrastic, so he's going to have I me. When it's a paraphrastic with I me, then whatever that verb is, participle verbal form is going to be, is existence. Are you with me? Listen, I me is an absolute, you have to learn this. It's an absolute status quo verb of existence, I me. Okay. So this puts this into existence. I me, whatever the participle is, which is the word what? Veiled, is veiled, puts that veiling in an existence, in a continued existence or process. Are you with me? Yes. I, there's a little technical, but you got to listen to me. Now, the word veiled is a perfect passive participle. What's the perfect tense mean? We dealt this last night. What's perfect tense? Something, done in the past, still Something completed in the past or the results it remains complete. That's important. Yeah. Completed in the past or results it remains completed in the present. Yeah. Right? right. Well, what have I got on the front? What's I, what's I mean? It's a present active indicative. The present tense is continuous. Yeah. It's, an ab, it's, an, it's a verb of absolute existence. Absolute status quo verb of existence. Are you with me? Now, when you add a present tense to a perfect, which means completed action, right? Completed action in the past, the results remains completed forever. With the I me on the front means that this is a, a, a state of a process going on that can be changed. What, what's the tense of I me? It's present. It's a present tense. Present tense means continuous action of whatever the participle is. Mm -hmm. Now, in the Greek language, I'm going to tell you something. The Greek language understands this. And so here's what kind of, here's what the Greeks say about this type of, of verbal form. They call it consummation. This is a consummation, para, per, perfect paraphrastic. All that means is that the, the, because this is attached to an absolute status quo verb of existence, what we have here in the word veiled in the perfect tense is, in a, is, is, is while it is a completed condition, it's in a process that can be changed. <laughs> and they have a word for that. They have a way of identifying that. In the Greek language, they call that a, a, a consummated, <laughs> consummated, okay, perfect. Which means that if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled, the person who has the, the gospel being veiled to somebody who is perishing, they're in a process that can be changed. There is hope for those who are perishing, even those, even those whose gospel has been veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the perishing, in whose case the perishing, case, in whose case the perishing, the God of this world, the devil, the God, notice that's a little G, 
with a definite article, by the way. And I gave, I, I, I gave the T a little T, because who he is. In whose case, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Even at that state, even at the state of hearing the gospel and not believing it, they are still alive, and as long as they're alive, there is still hope for them to what? Be rescued from perishing. So that they might, this is how, why Satan, look what Satan is doing. So that they might not, what? watch this now. He tries to veil the mind to the gospel of those who are perishing. He persuades them to listen to that foolishness. He does that so that they, this is his motive. This is the devil's motive. This is why he understands the centerpiece, whether you do or not, of the plan of God is Jesus Christ. So that they, the perishing, who still have an opportunity to get saved so that they might not see the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Do you know what was lost in Adam's fall? The image of Christ. And this is what is gained back for you when you get saved. And you know who knows that, whether you know it, you know who believes that, whether you believe it, is the devil. That's his warfare. Do you understand that's warfare? That's warfare. And you know what? You know what motivates him? Is that Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of God's great plan. Now, when a guy's caught in that position, this is why repentance is important. Because what is he, what, what, is, what is Satan trying to, what, what is the part of the human being that Satan's targeting? His mind, right? You know, what, you know what metanoia means? The word repentance in the Greek language is metanoia. You know what it means? It means change your mind. He, you still have power to change your mind. I did. I did. I heard the gospel. I went, I don't believe that. Guy dies. What are you talking about? Died 2,000 years ago, and I'm going to get help by that? Yeah. Believe in George Washington or something. But two years later, I got saved. I changed my mind. I went, you know what? I'm not going to be stupid. My grandfather didn't, didn't raise somebody to be stupid. What have I got to lose? If Jesus Christ died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead, this occurred 2,000 years ago and benefits me now, what do I know? I can't afford to take a chance. I mean, it's stupid. If I, if, I, if I believe, I go to heaven. If I don't believe, I go to hell. They haven't asked me for any money. They haven't asked me to join anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I think I'll take that deal. That's just how simple I got saved. I don't believe that. I had a change of mind. When I first heard it, I went, that's foolishness. Oh, geez. Bunch of people. You talk about church. I don't want to join nothing. I didn't come here to join anything. Here's a verse you ought to put down. 2 Corinthians 3.18. It'll take that image of Christ into your life. 2 Corinthians 3.18. Listen to me. Here's point number two. The greatest war ever fought was in heaven. There will never be a war like the war that was fought. The greatest war ever fought was in heaven before the foundation of the world. It was the first galaxy war before Star Wars. <laughs> if you're a Star Wars fan. It was a galaxy warfare. This war was a prelude to the warfare of the angelic conflict on earth. Ephesians, the sixth chapter, 10 through 17, put on the full armor of God, tells us how the warfare of the angelic conflict should be fought in the church age. 
Revelation, the 12th chapter, tells us how this war, this galaxy war, was fought at the beginning and will be fought at the end of human history, the tribulation of the second coming. Revelation, the 12th chapter, verse 7, shows you the prelude. He said, there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angel waging war with the dragon. That's a term used for Satan in the, in the galaxy warfare. The dragon and his angels waged war. You can read this again in Revelation 20, verse 2, the titles. Lucifer, the morning star, the Latin word. Lucifer, the Latin word for morning star or dragon, as he becomes known, was defeated. And three titles were given to him throughout time and eternity. As a result of, of that warfare, he's now called Satan, the adversary. He's called the devil, the accuser, and he's called the evil one of this world. In Revelation, the 20th chapter, verse 2, and he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, Adam and Eve story, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And by that, we know there was a fall of angels and there was a fall of mankind. The titles tell you that. The titles tell you that. They're not just meaningless titles. Here's my final point. The galaxy warfare or the warfare in eternity past affected the original created heaven and earth. In Genesis 1.1, we are told that God created Ba-Ra, that created out of himself the heavens and the earth. When God creates something out of himself, Ba-Ra, it's perfect. Yet when we read Isaiah 45.18, which I put on your paper, it says, And thus saith the Lord who created the heavens, he is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place. That word waste place is tohu, part of the tohu wabohu. He used tohu to show you because it means uninhabitable. Something happened between verse 1 and verse 2 because in verse 2, the heaven and the earth, the earth, in that heaven and earth, the earth is tohu wabohu. And Isaiah tells you what happened. It was the angelic conflict in eternity past. Because in verse 2, the earth is tohu. Tohu means uninhabitable. What we know is that Satan led a revolt against the plan of God that resulted in the galaxy warfare between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And his motivation, again, is Ezekiel 28.15. It says about him that he was blameless until one day unrighteousness was found in him. Isn't it interesting that Christ comes, your unrighteousness, he saves you, and now you're blameless. That's a reverse order. You know how you got it? Grace. Did it cost you anything? Nah. Genesis 1-2 says that there were four chaotic conditions, formless and void, uninhabitable, the earth, darkness, the light of, there is no light of God. The only time there wasn't that on earth was at day two. I mean, uh, verse two. When it says dark, he's talking about the devil and the darkness. He's talking about the darkness when he puts them in to Tarsus. He's talking about darkness where there is no light of God. First John 1, 5. Over the surface, here's the third thing, over the surface of the deep. That word deep is the abyss, is to Tarsus, which, is, which we understand where God created the prison of the angels. 2 Peter 2, 4 and Jude 6. Third, the earth was covered by primeval water. First, uh, 2 Peter 3, 5, Job 37, 10 frozen in time earth was frozen in time well what we would call time frozen in eternity i don't know how you talk that way but frozen for a time and finally the holy spirit hovered over the surface of the water or the whole planet earth 
hovered over the surface of the waters, which is that frozen idea, until day two. He is the eternal protector. He is what seals us until the day of redemption. Ephesians 1, 13, 14, and 4, 30, which is not on your paper. It is on day two that God separates the waters. Uh, next time when we come back, we're going to talk about... Uh, it's all on your paper. The Holy Spirit hovering over the earth. On the back, the back. It's on your back. Yeah. Do you see it? Do you see it down there on the bottom? Yeah, it's right on the bottom. It says the Holy Spirit. I put it in bold print. The Holy Spirit hovering over the surface of the waters until day two. You, you read all that when you go through the, the book uh, of it. All right. Let's, let's close in a word of prayer. We'll get out of here. Uh, Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for our study and for Awareness again of the angelic conflict. We need to be on our toes about it mentally, spiritually speaking. And uh, understand that we're victors in Christ. It's a matter of walking that victory out by faith under the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. We thank you for it. Uh, we've talked about a lot of things tonight, Father, but the primary thing was to show that in eternity past, there was the eternal life conference in which the plan of God was designed, the centerpiece was Jesus Christ. And the, the angelic conflict exists over that. Satan's going to revolt. He's going to lead a third of the angels in rebellion. And we resolve it. The human being on earth resolves it because he has volition to believe the, the will of God will of God for me to be saved by the gospel and no other way. No other way. There's no other way to be saved except through the gospel. Jesus Christ died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. There is no other way. That was designed in eternity past. There is no other way. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Christ. There is no other way. The devil would try to blind our minds to that truth. I pray tonight as those who listen to us on the internet, as well as those who have traveled by automobile, would get that message and get it strong because the devil is headed to the lake of fire and wants to take you with him. Don't be stupid. Believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be saved for time and eternity in Jesus' name. Amen.